depending upon your time zone, I can say good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. My name is uh, Joseph Hamill. I'm a professor emeritus in the biomechanics laboratory at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. And today I have the honor to introduce the 2020 International Society of Biomechanics and Sport, Hans Gross Emerging Scientist Lecture. This year, the lecture will be presented by Dr. Gillian Weir, postdoctoral fellow in the biomechanics lab at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Dr. Weir completed her PhD at the University of Western Australia in 2016, and then traveled across the world to the US for her postdoctoral fellowship at UMass. She's been a prolific researcher, having published 19 refereed publications since her graduation. And the majority of these have been a, uh, as a primary author. She has also co-authored a book chapter and published 22 abstracts uh, since completing her PhD. In addition, she has uh, presented many lectures at national and international conferences. Dr. Weir's interests include injury prevention as her uh, presentation today will attest. During her postdoctoral fellowship, she became an integral part of the biomechanics laboratory at UMass using such techniques as dynamical systems and musculoskeletal modeling in her research. She's also uh, consulted on injury prevention with professional teams in baseball, American football, Australian rules football, in addition to field hockey teams in the US and Australia. Please note that you can submit questions on live chat on YouTube during the presentation. And they will be answered at the uh, completion of the presentation. <clears throat> The title of uh, Dr. Weir's presentation today is ACL Injury Prevention in Team Sports, Biomechanically Informed Approaches and Applications. And now I would like to ask Jillian to present her lecture. Thank you very much, Joe, for the, the wonderful introduction. And I'd like to start off by thanking the International Society of Biomechanics for the extreme honor it is to receive this award. Today I'll uh, be presenting some research that I have uh, been doing throughout my postdoc with Professor Hamill and during my PhD at the University of Western Australia. So I don't really need to tell sports bi biomechanists that ACL injuries are bad. Um, this one in particular was bad for Australia. Chris Judd was an incredible Australian rules football player. Um, and in the first game of the last season that he was going to play before he retired, he tore his ACL. And uh, these injuries are not only uh, debilitating to uh, football fans, but also to the athlete. Uh, to continue to participate in team sports and multi-directional sports such as these, athletes often have to have reconstructive surgery, uh, which combined with rehabilitation takes athletes out of competition for upwards of 12 months. We also know that these athletes have a higher likelihood of uh, sustaining a secondary injury more than 60% of these athletes don't return to the same level of competition and there are an increased risk of developing knee osteoarthritis later on in life, which we know is associated with a myriad of health-related uh, concerns. So the focus of my talk today will be on this injury prevention framework, which has been specifically applied to ACL injuries. And what I'd particularly like to present today is some research looking at identifying modifiable biomechanical risk factors of ACL injury and how we can use those to identify high-risk athletes and then place these athletes in biomechanically informed injury or re-injury prevention programs. So researchers have been investigating injury prevention strategies for the past 30 or so years but injury rates have still continued to, to increase. And this is not uh, because the research that has been, been performed is not effective, but we have many different issues with uh, higher sports participation more now than ever, uh, particularly uh, with the pandemic, participating in different sports and, um, and different, uh, the increase in speed of games and, and rule changes as well. The majority of these injuries are actually non-contact in nature, which is actually great news. Uh, they occur during tasks such as single leg landing and sidestepping. And because they're non-contact in nature, meaning there's no contact with another athlete, it essentially means that uh, it suggests that these athletes are, are preventable. 
We've also seen that females are four to eight times more likely to tear their ACL in sport compared with their male counterparts. And there's a lot of research looking at this, whether it be related to non-modifiable anatomical risk factors, uh, modifiable biomechanical risk factors, and also social cultural factors as well. So what actually causes the ACL to rupture? There's been a number of, of research strategies implemented to understand this. The first being cadaveric research, where we can put cad cadaver knees into a rig and then apply different forces and torques to the knee joint until the ACL ruptures. We can also have athletes come into the lab and perform sidestepping and single leg landing tasks, as I mentioned, uh, which, which are associated with injury, but we can do this in a safe manner in a controlled lab set setting and look at the forces and torques that occur at the knee joint during these tasks. We obviously can't ask athletes to come into the lab and tear their ACL uh, by performing multiple uh, high risk maneuvers, but we can use the safely measured biomechanics and then um, put them into a computer simulation and tear their ACL in the computer simulation. And from all of these research strategies, we know that externally applied and combined knee flexion, valgus and internal rotation knee moments elevate ACL strain. We also know for some, from some in vitro research that these moments and ACL strain are the highest during that initial part of stance. So often when you see um, athletes tear their ACL in a match, uh, you can see that it happens almost instantly after they place uh, their foot on the ground. So by knowing the biomechanical mechanisms of injury, we can then look at um, how we can modify those, the way that those uh, mechanisms or, or forces are experienced by the body. So with knowing that the ultimate mechanism of injury is a load being applied greater than the tissue's tolerance to withstand that load, uh, ideally we would increase the strength of the ligament itself, but we know ligaments are relatively avascular. So we have to somehow modify the way that the externally applied knee moments are experienced. And there's a couple of different ways that we can do this. The first is we can decrease um, the external, uh, externally applied loads by changing an athlete's technique or kinematic strategy. And there's been a lot of research uh, looking at this, but just to highlight a few points, uh, we've seen that upper body kinematics is associated with both uh, valgus knee moments and prospectively when we look at ACL injury risk. If we think about the mass dis distribution of the body, we know that the upper body contributes to greater than 50% of our mass. So any small changes in trunk dynamics will significantly affect distal limb joint loading. We also see when we, uh, when we watch an ACL injury in sport that athletes have a very extended knee posture. And this has also been shown in, um, in cadaver studies where low knee flexion angles are associated with ACL strain. And recently we've seen that much alike of the running literature, four foot strike postures uh, reduce knee joint moments as well. So this is talking about the kinematic strategies, but when the loads being applied to the body are high, we need to modify the way that these forces are experienced. So to do that, we can increase the muscle support around the knee joint and above. So it doesn't necessarily need to be the muscles crossing the knee joint as recent simulation research has shown that non-spanning knee, uh, non-standing knee muscles um, contribute to, to knee joint moments. So if we increase the strength of the gluteals example, for example, then we can, can help reduce the moments applied to the knee. We also know that, that uh, the quadriceps and gastrocnemius muscle forces co-contract together to increase knee joint compression. And, and by doing that, that helps stabilize the knee joint as well. So we know that these sort of countermeasures are important for reducing ACL injury risk. The last thing that we can play with is perception, which will influence both how we change an athlete's technique and improving muscle support. And this is sort of what I've been working on with uh, professors Hamill and, and Van Emmerich at UMass for the past three or four years, where uh, if you look here, we have uh, on the left-hand side, we have a, a planned sidestep and on the right-hand side, we have an unplanned sidestep for the same athlete. And you can see the whole body dynamics of, of those tasks, while they're the same task, one with just reduced planning time, the dynamics of the movement is extremely different. And we know that in team sports, we perform a lot of reactionary tasks. So the, the athlete is reacting to the ball where the ball is on the field. 
that's reacting to an opponent to make sure that they can avoid, evade that opponent. And in fact, we know that knee moments are higher during unanticipated sports tasks. So what is the difference in technique when we look at, at these tasks? And this is a project that we did uh, a couple of years ago at UMass where we were looking at, I couldn't really come to UMass and, and not do a bit of work in dynamical systems. And it's been uh, incredible to sort of see, see that point of view uh, when we look at ACL injuries. It's, and it's been a really interesting um, few projects that we've been working on. So in this study, we were looking at if we reduce planning time, how does that affect an athlete's coordination and coordination variability? So when we think about sports tasks on the field, an athlete that has high coordination variability essentially means that they have multiple solutions to achieve the same task, which is critical for success in multi-directional team sports. And to sort of simulate this, uh, to reduce planning time, what we did is we just compared an anticipated sidestep with an unanticipated sidestep. So when we speak about variability, we have a couple of different kinds. So the first being endpoint variability. And if we use the example of me throwing a dart at a dartboard, I always want the dart to hit the bullseye and I don't want it to deviate from the bullseye. So in that case, I want really low endpoint variability um, because I always want to, to hit the bullseye. When we think about this in relation to sidestepping, while we still want the athlete to be able to achieve many different um, change of direction angles, some endpoint variability metrics would be things like stride length, stride time, or change of direction angle. But then the dynamics of the way that the athlete achieves that change of direction is important. So think about if I am then throwing the dart at the bullseye, I want many different kinematic solutions to achieve that same task. So I can do it in many different ways. So when we talk about coordination variability, we're essentially talking about the trial to trial deviations in the segment movement patterns and the flexibility of the body system to adapt to the external perturbations. So in this case, we have the athlete reacting to the oncoming player, as well as the, uh, the other players obviously aren't photographed in this, in this image. And we can look at coordination variability on this sort of theoretical waveform where first we sort of, we want athletes to have a high amount of variability because that means that the tissues will be stressed in many different ways. So we're having forces being applied, you know, in multiple points in the, in the knee joint. But if we have too low variability, then these stresses are concentrated to one particular area. And there's been some research looking at MRIs across the season of, of the ACL and showing that some athletes experience some degradation of, of the ACL as the season progresses, which may be related to this sort of framework. But then on the other hand, we might have athletes who have too high variability, which essentially means that their co coordination is sporadic and the tissues aren't primed to counter the external loads. And this sort of range of healthy variability is the, the million dollar question. And how can we fit athletes into this sort of middle band here? So in this study, we had uh, the UMass men's soccer team who kindly participated in this research where um, we had them come into our lab and perform an unanticipated sidestepping protocol where essentially they perform uh, a few randomised sports tasks so that the, the sidestep that's unanticipated, uh, they don't predict because it's the only unplanned task. And within that, we, we chose five specific joint couplings based on the literature. So with uh, coordination, we can look at combined postures of joints rather than just a single joint in isolation. So here we looked at uh, joint couplings of the lower limb, which simulated postures such as dynamic knee valgus. And then we looked at uh, couplings of the trunk and pelvis in all three planes, because as I mentioned before, the coordination of the trunk is, is quite imperative for lower limb loading. And we use a modified vector coding technique to, uh, to establish the coordination from the mean phase angle. So we can sort of uh, look at here, we just have the, the knee and the hip angles plotted against each other. Um, but by using a, a vector coding technique, we can then have that on one waveform and bin that waveform into sort of in phase motion, anti phase motion, uh, proximally dominant and, and distal dominant. And then by working out the variability of that mean phase angle, we then can establish the coordination variability. So just a snapshot into the results here. So we have our five couplings here. And the key takeaway was that we found that in most of the couplings, when we went from anticipated to unanticipated sidestepping, so we reduced planning time, 
we saw that coordination becomes more in phase. So the, the movement becomes less smooth and, and less rhythmic when you don't have enough uh, time to plan and initiate the movement. And what we also found is here we have the coordination variability. So black is unanticipated and gray is anticipated. And you can see in general that the unanticipated condition is more variable. And when we look at this with statistical parametric mapping, so the shaded areas essentially uh, indicate where they're significantly different. You can see that the trunk, the two of the trunk couplings are, there is much higher variability in the unanticipated condition. And particularly when we look at the lower limb, the variability in an unanticipated sidestepping is during that initial part of stance, which is where loading is the highest. As I mentioned before, we know that ACL strain and knee joint moments are peak sort of in the initial 30% of stance. So as task planning time decreases, coordination variability increases. And this is likely a result of um, athletes utilizing more degrees of freedom in order to achieve this more complex task. And these were healthy athletes, remember, so, so none of them were injured at the time of testing. They were all healthy um, and competing at the time. So we still assume that the variability in both of these tasks is within that green healthy window. So the next step for this research would be to evaluate athletes prospectively um, and look at their variability during both sporting tasks to see how that maps to injury in the long term. So I've been sort of talking about the, the stance phase of sidestepping and which is where a lot of us have dedicated a lot of our research, but recently we've sort of been thinking about um, the step before. So in the video that I showed of the uh, planned versus unplanned sidestepping in, in the beginning, we know that the dynamics, even when you watch an athlete approach that cut is very different. And research has shown that trunk angular momentum has in the preparatory phase has been associated with valgus knee moments, which we, know, which we know is associated with ACL strain. So if we modify the preparatory phase, either technically or perceptually, and by perceptually, I mean, we could train the athlete to have a different technique in stance, or we could train the athlete to have better reaction time. We could then have an effect on what happens during the stance phase. And this is some other research that we're working on with one of our graduate students, uh, Sam Zeff at UMass. And he's been looking at this where he's evaluating, evaluating head trunk coordination and eventually gaze orientation during the preparatory phase to see how athletes then plan and initiate movement there. This was another study that we did with uh, Dr. Hannah Wyatt when she was doing her postdoc with Joe um, at UMass a few years ago. And she was interested in looking at the whole body center of mass control during planned and unplanned sidestepping maneuvers. And you can see here, we just have a quick snapshot of the um, anticipated condition in blue, and we can overlay that with the uh, unanticipated condition. And you can see just by looking at the skeletons that the, the uh, kinematics are different. But when we actually look at the uh, center of mass displacement, you can see that in the anticipated condition, uh, unanticipated condition, it's much more posteriorly displaced. And here we have both the preparatory and the stance phase and the shaded area indicates again from statistical parametric mapping that those two conditions are different. So in the anterior posterior direction, we have um, a difference in, in the posterior displacement of the whole body center of mass. And then when we look in the frontal plane, we know that um, athletes don't prepare, you know, they're running straight on and then all of a sudden have to, to redirect their movement. So there's much more lateral um, trunk placement. And because of the mass of the trunk, it causes the whole body center of mass to be more lateral in the unanticipated condition. And we know based on the position of the center of mass and the knee joint center, that will have a significant effect on, our, on knee joint loading. So I've spoken a bit about the countermeasures for injury, and now I'd like to discuss how we can use that knowledge in implementation science. So it's impossible to actually predict injury, as we know, um, and this, this has been highlighted, uh, the limitations of screening has been highlighted in this really nice paper by Roald Barr in 2016 in, in BJSM. But it's important that we do screen athletes in the sense of um, you wouldn't give every single one of your personal training clients the exact same exercise program. So it's important if we're going to advance the field that we really personalize the medicine that we're giving these athletes. And there are a few steps that we need to take 
um, in determining the most appropriate way to screen athletes, uh, especially now with the big data science um, venture that we are all on together with our engineering and our computer science colleagues, it's important first that we can establish that our screening tools can be used across multiple labs if we're going to share data. So this was a, a grant that I got, an in, in, international travel grant that I got from the International Society of Biomechanics and where we had the Hockey Roos, which is the Australian National uh, Olympic field hockey team. They, um, we worked with them for a number of years and they're an incredible uh, group of athletes who I was lucky enough to work with for a few years. And they won the gold medal at the uh, Commonwealth Games in Glasgow. And literally the next morning, they got on a bus and drove to Liverpool John Moores University, where we were working with uh, Mark Robinson and Jos van Rentingham, where we had the athletes perform our unanticipated sidestepping protocol in their lab, where we modified code that we used for our unplanned uh, protocol that we used at UWA uh, into their lab. So their technicians were, were really helpful in terms of uh, building a new program. And then a week later, we had them sidestep again in the lab at the University of Western Australia. And so what we found is that if they perform the same, same protocol in two different labs by using the same models, that we can match the, the knee joint moments and our injury risk measures. So we could confidently do that. The next thing is, is what tasks that we actually use to screen an athlete. So we know in sports that athletes perform uh, double leg, single leg, uh, landing, jumping, sidestepping. Um, so this was a study where we were looking at uh, how does injury risk classification change when you screen an athlete with a single leg landing task versus an unanticipated sidestepping task. And ideally we would screen athletes with, you know, 50 different exercises so that we could, um, we could try and mimic exactly what's happening on the field all of the time, but we know that's not always feasible. So we sort of came up with these injury risk thresholds, which was just based on a Gaussian distribution of this data. And you can see that when we screen athletes uh, with both tasks, sometimes an athlete will be deemed high risk based on their um, single leg landing, but not from their sidestepping and vice versa. So the message from this was, we, you know, ideally, and I'll talk about this in a moment, will be that we would test an athlete on the field because then we can get an ecological measure of what they're doing all of the time. And this was a sort of raised the question at ISBS a few years ago. Uh, we had a question at one of our presentations where, um, because we're doing a lot of work with the hockey roos, the question was whether we should actually be testing the athletes doing the unanticipated sidestepping protocol while they're in a field hockey specific posture. Um, and what we found is when we compared uh, the unanticipated protocol and compared the knee jo joint moments across tasks, that in the frontal and sagittal plane that the moments again mapped well between tasks. Uh, we had some differences in internal rotation knee moments, which were attributed in the huge difference in the posture. So you can see that in a field hockey posture, the athlete is extremely flexed as well. So we saw some associations with uh, trunk, trunk flexion and internal rotation knee moments. So while we can measure athletes in the, the lab and we've all been doing it for a long time, the next sort of critical step in athlete screening is being able to do this on the field. Um, so I would like to talk about a study that we've, we've been working on uh, with Hockey Australia with that. But first I would like to delve into how we've used 3D biomechanical screening to intervene in a professional sports setting. So we worked with the Fremantle Dockers, who is a, a professional Australian rules football team. And as David Lloyd said yesterday, best uh, football code in the world. Uh, you can watch it online at the moment, actually. Um, <clears throat> so we were working with Jason Weber, who's the head of high performance there, and he's probably one of the greatest uh, performance coaches and humans that I've got to work with. And uh, so he's very knowledgeable. And he works within a, a really great medical and high performance team. And they have a number of informed empirical checkboxes that they use for their return to play and return to perform process. And they came to us because they wanted one last checkbox that they could use when they uh, were when the players were returning to play. They wanted to make sure that they were 100% ready and that they would continue to play for a long period of time. The difference with Australian football or Australian sports in general is that because of our population density, uh, it's really important for us to maintain uh, the long-term uh, playing careers of these elite players because we don't have 
uh, more people to choose from as you do in, in the United States. So I'll just present a case study of one of the athletes that we tested. This player tore his right ACL, uh, which was a non-contact during a game. Um, and then, so he came into the lab eight months after he had surgery. Oops. And so we, when, he, when they come into the lab, they perform unanticipated sidestepping and single leg landing tasks. And we perform that both on their contralateral limb and the reconstructed limb. So this is at a point where he's already training and, and returned to sort of almost full, full contact training. So we compare the knee joint moments in the contralateral limb uh, to the, the knee moments on the reconstructed limb because we know that athletes are not only high risk of re-tearing their injured limb, but also their contralateral limb as well. So it's important that we look at both. And then if the knee moments are elevated on one limb uh, versus the other, we also compare that to a normative database as well. Uh, and, then, and then also if the moments are high, then we can go and look at the kinematic strategies that that athlete uses and, um, and then intervene with their technique as well. The final thing that we do is that the athlete comes back a few days later and performs an isokinetic dynamometry test where we look at peak concentric and eccentric quadriceps and hamstring torques. So uh, just looking into his results here, we have, uh, you can see straight away when we look at the frontal and transverse plane knee moments. So we have the reconstructed limb in orange and the contralateral limb in blue. You can see that there's a huge difference between uh, the reconstructed and contralateral limb, both in for the valgus knee moments and the internal rotation knee moments. And although that's within our normative database, it, it may not be normal for that athlete. So when we looked at his kinematics and here we have the, um, the 2D overlay of the 3D biomechanics. And you can see just by looking at this here, the red line here is the ground reaction force vector. When you look at that relative to the knee joint center, we already know that the valgus knee moments are high. We didn't even need to do inverse dynamics. But um, so when we actually looked at his technique, you can see that he has uh, a really large lateral trunk flexion angle. So when we compared that to the database, it was much higher. And you can see that visually here. And he had a really uh, wide foot placement. So those were our sort of two first messages that we gave to the, um, the Dockers high performance team. And what they went on to do with that information was they uh, monitored his change of direction and agility training with video. So the player was always getting live feedback uh, during his rehab component of his training. And then he could use that biofeedback to modify his technique. And we obviously can't change technique without uh, changing strength as well. So the uh, strength conditioning coaches were able to intervene with some sort of bracing and dynamic trunk stability work uh, during some, some change of direction maneuvers as well. When we looked at the um, dyno dynamometry results, we saw that the peak concentric quadriceps torques were much lower on the reconstructed limb. And we know that uh, quadriceps strength is associated with long-term uh, knee health-related outcomes. So this was really important for the, for the physiotherapist to intervene with. So what we also saw is when he landed uh, from the single leg landing, that he didn't have, uh, he had a really small knee flexion range of motion. So these results in combination sort of suggest that uh, he couldn't support his knee in, in flexion through the quadriceps. So the, the second intervention was looking at uh, increasing strength around the knee joint to accommodate knee flexion. And so following that, we had the athlete come back in again. So we, we've done multiple retests of the athletes. If they're happy with the first result, then, then he's good to go. But for, for this, in the case of this athlete, he came back and retested his isokinetics and he passed those. And then he returned to play 11 months later. So you can see that by combining our biomechanics knowledge with implementation science and practitioners, that we can work together to um, design sort of really informed return to play strategies. And while 3D screening was an effective tool in an elite setting, it's not quite feasible for community level athletes, especially when we're talking about uh, screening on a mass scale. So as part of my PhD, we developed a two dimensional video screening tool, 
where we had athletes come into the lab and you can see, see an athlete warming up and practicing the unanticipated sidestep here. Um, we had sort of elite female athletes and junior female athletes come in the lab and we synchronized the 3D motion capture with the 2D video. And the 2D video was just from a simple uh, sort of 50 hertz off the shelf Sony video camera. So we looked at the kinematic factors that were associated with ACL injury risk. And these are sort of ones that I have mentioned previously. So things like knee flexion angle, trunk postures, um, dynamic knee valgus. And we could measure these with silicon coach. So you could do the same thing with free software such as Kenovia, which we have done separately in another study or things like Dartfish as well. And we first wanted to see whether we could measure these reliably across testers because the idea being that we would give this tool to parents and coaches and, and athletes themselves to then measure um, the kinematics you know, on, an, on an iPhone app or something like that. So we found that all of the variables were, we could track those reliably. And then we put those variables into a linear mixed model and a backward stepwise linear regression to see if we could predict the knee joint moments. And so we have these equations where we could effectively predict peak knee flexion, uh, valgus and internal rotation knee moments from these kinematic strategies. And so there's sort of a mix in between of, of each of those there. And then we obviously had a training and a, and a testing data set. And we saw that when we compared the peak knee moments ve measured uh, from the 3D inverse dynamics procedures and compared those to a 2D predicted uh, knee joint moments that they matched really well there as well. And so these equations are published and available. However, we still have the issue of digitization where 2D joint center positions in video analysis software still takes a significant amount of time. And if we want to be sure that this tool can predict not injury risk, but actual incidents of injury, we need to screen hundreds, but probably more likely thousands of athletes prospectively. So one way to combat this is being tackled by Professor Alderson at the University of Western Australia in conjunction with her colleagues here as part of the Digital Athlete Project. And within this project, they've utilised 20 years of legacy motion capture trials and three and a half thousand of these being uh, sidestepping trials. And Bill Johnson, who's uh, pictured here, finished his PhD at the University of Western Australia a few years ago. And what he did was he trained a neural network to predict the ground reaction forces and knee joint moments from the kinematic trajectories. And the final model only needed eight of the 68 markers used in the full body marker set, which is sort of indicated by these, these dots here. And what he found is that um, with that model, he saw that both the predicted ground reaction forces and the knee joint moments, which are in red here, match extremely well with the measured ground truth data, which is in blue. So they overlay each other really well. So while we can remove the force plate, which might be a little bit upsetting for AMTI with the aforementioned algorithms, we can still have the issue of infeasibility of the 3D marker-based motion capture. We can't use that during a live match or a training session. And so this is some of the great work that Dr. Marion Munt and Corey Morris are doing where, um, where they <coughs> are going directly from 2D video uh, to the knee joint loads. So we have uh, automatic tracking here of the, of the kinematics of the athlete. And then from that, we can predict the 3D knee joint moments, which is a huge step because we can go directly and we're going back to 2D video, but we can utilize 2D video from, uh, from a match. And then from that match analysis, we can then measure live on field kinematics and kinetics, which then removes the issue that we have with ecological validity of the tasks that we use within our labs. So the last piece I'd like to talk about today is how we can use um, screening to personalize uh, medicine and personalize our injury prevention training programs. So there's been a, a wide amount of research looking at injury prevention training and they've used combinations of uh, modalities looking at resistance, plyometric balance and technique training. And you can see this is just a trajectory that I pulled from PubMed where uh, over the past, particularly over the past you know, five or 10 years, there's been a lot of research published in this area. 
And we know in general from these meta-analyses that uh, the injury prevention programs do work. But if you've, if you've worked among a team setting, sometimes it's really hard to get a coach to invest in injury prevention training, especially when we have to redistribute the time spent in certain training drills towards injury prevention. So if we increase the feasibility and effectiveness of these interventions, we can get greater buy-in because we know that not all interventions are effective. And that raises a question as to whether if we target training towards um, targeting the biomechanical mechanisms of injury, then perhaps the training can be more effective. So this was something that we looked at where rather than choosing a modality of training, so doing a balance intervention for ACL injury prevention or doing a resistance intervention for pre injury prevention, we looked at instead designing exercises that would target the countermeasures of injury. So we had four key countermeasures that we were trying to target. The first being increasing knee flexion and knee flexion range of motion. So we can use both technique and uh, resistance training to achieve that. Uh, the second message was looking at dynamic trunk control, where, as I mentioned before, uh, there's even been some research looking at simulation studies where if you move your whole body centre of mass four centimetres towards the intended direction of travel, you can reduce knee moments by up to 50% in a computer simulation, which is massive. So if we improve the dynamic trunk control, then um, we can help reduce the load applied to the knee joint. The third was looking at increasing gastric pneumus muscle strength. And you see from a lot of the successful training interventions that a lot of them include plyometric exercises, which may actually be um, unintentionally or intentionally targeting this countermeasure. And our last message was, we often see this posture a lot in, in ACL injury events where uh, we sort of see a dynamic knee valgus posture. And it's not only a posture of the knee, but it's the posture of the hip. So if we help uh, elevate the, um, the strength of the gluteal muscles, we can help prevent athletes from getting into this posture. So we searched through the literature and we came up with uh, a bunch of exercises. Uh, there are 40 exercises that we came up with. And these 40 exercises are, are nothing fancy or nothing functional. It's everything that you would have seen before, but the exercises were intentionally selected to target these four biomechanical countermeasures. And you can actually find the videos of these in the supplementary material uh, in the paper here. The, the link is just there. And so we have this example here where we have uh, the athlete doing a box jump. And down the bottom, we have the, the medallion of the training, which is plyometric. So if, for example, the coach wanted to do a plyometric session, they could pull all the plyometric exercises out of the program. Then it also has a biomechanical training focus. So if we had results from the screening, which indicated that the athlete had uh, poor, had really had a really extended knee at foot strike, and that was something that we need to work on, we could pull all the exercises from the program that just focused on knee flexion. Then we just have some some basic training messages to make sure the athlete is performing the task well. And then from that, um, essentially any coach in any environment can use this intervention. Uh, to best fit their environment. We've particularly chosen body weight exercises here so that you don't need any sort of equipment to do this as well. So we uh, implemented this program uh, in the Hockey Australia Hockey Brews program. And by we, I'm, I mean the high performance team who were really critical to this research. So Kate Starr, who was the strength and conditioning coach at the time in conjunction with Jennifer Cook, Carmel Goodman and Claire Ricicci worked together to, to pull the, all the exercises that we gave them to then work within their training environment. We obviously are researchers working in the lab and not working in uh, the gym and the field where, where they truly understand their, their setting and their sporting setting. So what we did is, what they did is we just, in, con in conjunction, we designed a nine week intensive uh, training program where the athletes did four sessions a week, 20 minutes per session. And these were interspersed among their gym sessions, which is in the video here. And then also uh, on the field during their warm ups. We also wanted to know, well, is nine weeks really enough? Do we need to maintain something for a little bit longer? So we did a 16 week maintenance training phase. So that was a lower volume, 
Um, and we did three sessions a week for, for 10 minutes a session. And those were all implemented among their warm up. So as biomechanists, we're obviously interested in seeing the influence of a targeted biomechanically informed injury prevention protocol on uh, injury risk. So we looked at uh, full body kinematics, knee joint moments and muscle activity strategies uh, within an un unanticipated sidestep. And then because um, when you, again, when you're working in a, in a high performance team or any team in general, you want to make sure that you're not uh, impeding performance in any way by removing time away spent on, on skills and, and other performance kind of training. So we also looked at performance where we uh, measured some performance variables. And we have to remember as well that injury risk and performance aren't mutually exclusive. They can, uh, the training in both areas can help help the other. And then finally, because we wanna make sure that our injury risk measures actually translate into prospective injury rates, we also measured uh, incidents of lower limb injuries. So we measured the intervention uh, in, a, in an intervention season in 2013. And lucky for us, uh, obviously in an elite setting, they have you know, years and years worth of data that they record really well. So we're able to compare this to a regular training season. So the season before we had even started talking about the intervention. And not to spoil their results, but they were quite happy with the way the intervention was run. So they actually continued the maintenance phase, not only for that initial 16 weeks, but for many years afterwards. Um, so, so Kate Starr, who was the performance coach here at the time, has now gone on to work at an AFLW team, the Fremantle Dockers as well, actually. And she's still sort of uh, into implementing these kind of injury prevention training strategies. And across those three years, we measured, again, our injury incidents, injury risk and athletic performance. So what we saw are just a, a snapshot of some of the results. We saw that um, we had sort of two groups within the, the athletes. We had people that responded to training and those that didn't respond to training. Remember that we're working now at this point in time, we're working with an elite team who train extensively. So um, we saw that these athletes, we had non-responders who didn't respond to training. But when we compare them to the uh, responder athletes, the responder athletes at baseline actually had you know, 23% higher peak knee valgus moments, which may indicate that perhaps these athletes are, are slightly at a higher risk of injury. And following the uh, injury prevention program, so the first nine week phase, we saw that the uh, responder athletes reduced their knee moments by almost 30%, and that was maintained during the maintenance phase. One of our um, biomechanically informed training messages was to increase the gluteal muscle strength. And what we saw following the intervention was that the total muscle activation of the, of the gluteal, so glute med and glute max, increased by almost 30% uh, in that intensive phase. So we can see a direct translation of targeting that muscle group um, and seeing the results on, on the muscle activity. Uh, luckily, we didn't uh, stuff up their performance, so we, it was quite nice. We saw um, sort of a maintenance of their 1RM strength, improvements in their acceleration capacity and, and aerobic capacity from, from a shuttle run test as well. And then when we looked at uh, injury incidents, so we looked at this over the three years, we saw that in terms of ACL injuries, they had three ACL injuries in the season prior to us intervening, which was partially one of the reasons why we partnered uh, in the beginning, because they were really interested in, in learning some new ways which they can uh, implement some different strategies in, in their setting. So following the intervention, so every single athlete that participated in the initial intervention uh, did not sustain an ACL injury many years post. And then when we look at lower limb injuries as a whole, you can see that by implementing biomechanically informed training among a setting where um, the high performance staff were, were intervening in their own ways as well, we can see that we can reduce lower limb injuries as a whole. A few th things to consider when we're doing these ideal training scenarios. The first thing is that we're working with a high performance team and we had a, a high coach to athlete ratio. So by having more coaches to the number of athletes, that helps us make sure that athletes are adhering and performing the tasks in the way that we want them to achieve it. And here we have, you know, many high performance and, and very skilled coaches. And we also have a hundred people waiting to do internships at a team. So it's really easy for us to make sure that the athletes are complying. In this setting as well, we also have 
uh, athletes who are who must you know have to come to training so we have really high attendance and compliance of the athletes in this instance which differs from community level training where if you don't feel like doing netball training on a tuesday night at nine o'clock then then you just don't go and then because of that your exposure to injury prevention decreases and we also had really high athlete engagement. So before we initiated this intervention, there was a lot of education of the athletes on ACL injuries, the long-term outcomes, how it affects them immediately, how it affects them in the long-term and throughout each stage of, of us testing them. So we, I think we ended up doing about seven or eight different uh, instances where they came into the lab for different studies, uh, not just this one, they were always informed of the results. So they really bought into to this, which is really important to make sure that that athletes and coaches and parents are, um, are involved in the process as well. So we've sort of that intervention was in a in a nice ideal setting, but how does that how does that change when we put this into a, a, a sort of a community level setting where we have a number of other constraints? So this was a study that uh, John Stainer and Joanna Nicholas did as uh, part of their PhD and honors projects where they had. Uh, female community level hockey players come in and participate in, in almost the same training program. So in this case, we had a um, regular training group, with, which was a, a group of female athletes who just did what they normally did. And then we had an intervention group where we had, uh, where they did their regular training plus two sessions of 20 minutes of the same injury prevention training. And, you know, ideally for them, we would give them a higher exposure than the Olympic athletes because you would think perhaps that they would need it more. But these athletes only train twice a week. And if we got them to do 40 minutes of injury prevention training, they definitely would not go. <laughs> um, so some other considerations that you have to think about when, when doing these sorts of things. And this is why it's important to think about personalising uh, injury prevention training for each athlete, which is sometimes can be infeasible, but with the new techniques that we have, it's really important that we maximize the time that we have with the athlete. So what we found in this study was that in the regular training group, they maintained or they had higher valgus and internal rotation knee moments after the season. So we measured unplanned sidestepping before and after the, the intervention, just as we did with the intervention group. So over the course of a season, uh, knee moments increase, which we've also seen in, in um, Australian rules football studies similar to this as well. But then when we looked at the intervention group, they didn't have reductions in the knee joint moments. So they weren't able to reduce their risk of injury, but we were able to maintain their risk of injury. So there are a number of different factors that contribute to, to working in both an elite and a community level setting, which we need to, to maximize. So finally, a look toward the future. And I think uh, David Lloyd presented this extremely eloquently uh, yesterday. I feel extremely lucky to be beginning my career when we have some incredible advancements in wearable technology and markless motion capture. And I think we can work with our sort of engineering and computer science counterparts to further the field of sports biomechanics, where we can constantly gather data on the field in an ecological setting and generate large databases, which we can all share and can contribute to. And we can use this information to personalise medicine. So we can use the, the live on-field uh, dynamics of an athlete to personalise injury prevention training. And this is some work that we're doing at UMass where we're looking at things like head trunk coordination and gaze reorientation and how we can better organise the preparation or the penultimate step in unanticipated sidestepping to look more like anticipated sidestepping where we know the knee moments are lower. And then we're also working with the BME department at UConn where we can design personalized injury prevention programs based on optimization results from OpenSim. So essentially we can uh, work out what the best optimization is for the athlete based on reducing their knee moments. And then from that, you know, the, by comparing the optimized uh, sidestep versus the, the raw sidestep, we can then decide what exercises are best going to achieve that for that particular athlete. And finally, as a society, as sports biomechanists, we come from and work within a number of different backgrounds. And I feel in my early career already, the critical impact that applied scientists and practitioners have made on contextualizing my research. 
So I feel that working together among multidisciplinary teams will ultimately allow us to feasibly translate our injury prevention messages to coaches, to athletes and to parents to ultimately reduce injuries in sport and keep us healthy and active for many years to come. So I think this could be another 45 minute presentation on its own, um, but I'll try and keep it brief. I'd first like to thank uh, the International Society of Biomechanics and Sports for this incredible honour. Uh, my favourite place in the world to be in the summer every year is at an ISBS conference. Um, they, I've met some incredible researchers and I've got to meet and make the most wonderful friends as, as part of that. So I highly recommend to, uh, to students to, to keep coming to the ISBS conference. Um, I, it's, I always feel really comfortable presenting my research there. I'd like to acknowledge my funding that I've received from Hockey Australia, the University of Western Australia and the ISB. And then now to all of my mentors. And I think I could only achieve this with um, the support of the people around me. So first of all, I think when I read my second year biomechanics textbook, I never imagined that I would spend four years working alongside Professor Joe Hamill. So thank you, Joe, so much for your support and the knowledge that I'm constantly trying to absorb from you uh, and also to Professor Richard Van Emmerich. I'd like to thank Matt Trudeau and the team at Brooks Running for uh, all of the applied science and, and industry work that I've got to see and, and work within for the past four years at UMass. To my uh, wonderful PhD mentors, uh, Jackie Alderson, Bruce Elliott and John Donnelly, thank you so much. Uh, I have a, a few people popping up here and it's sort of people that I've been lucky to work alongside and people that truly inspire me. So thank you all so much. And to my two greatest mentors in life, uh, mum and dad, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Julian, thanks for a really inspiring talk. And uh, I'm going to take the uh, chair's prerogative and ask you the first question. Okay. Um, and you mentioned this in your talk uh, very early on, that there's been a great deal of research into uh, risk factors for um, injury, this particularly ACL injury. But the number of ACL injuries still increases. And... Um, has the research that you've done and others have done on ACL really affected uh, the rate of ACL injuries? Yeah, that's a, a great question, Joe. Very loaded question. I think um, there has been a, a huge body of research in, in ACL injury prevention uh, by, by a lot of great researchers. And I think we have a number of different uh, contributors to the elevated uh, incidence of ACL injury where we have uh, socio-cultural factors, where we have inc increased participation in sports, people participating in different sports. So, for example, in the uh, AFLW, which is the Professional Australian Women's Football League, they actually have the highest amount of ACL injuries in the world. And part, part of the reason for that is that the athletes have only been competing in that sport for two years. So we have... It, they recruit athletes from uh, athletics. There was a javelin player who tore her ACL and she hadn't ever played an evasive sport really before that. So we have factors like that. Um, but I think that as, as a whole, I think the next step is really uh, this on-field wearable and markerless technology where we can uh, perform our research in a really ecolo ecologically <clears throat> balanced setting. Okay. Uh, I have a, a few questions uh, that have come in from the live chat. And uh, the first one is, would you suggest using your uh, TJAS ACSM protocol for injured athletes after they return to play? Yeah, I think so. The, the program essentially, because you have each of the, the biomechanically informed training messages, <laughs> if you were able to, and it would be a point of where you would have to understand the point of rehab that the athlete was in. So you would perform the regular stages of rehab and then implement uh, those exercises at varying stages. So we know, say, for example, at 
two months post injury, you don't want the athlete doing any jumping and landing, but six to you know, six months onwards, we want them doing that. So if you know, especially if it's a non-contact injury, how that injury was sustained. So mm-hmm. if you can look, go back and look at those postures and say, actually the athlete has really poor dynamic trunk control and that's what we want to focus on. And you can pull those exercises from the TJ AS, ACSM paper and then focus directly on, on those exercises. Okay. Um, the second question is rather long, so I'll read it off. You touched on the interplay between injury risk and performance near the end of your lecture. Were any of the different members of the coaching staff you worked with concerned that there would be a trade-off between movements which lead to a heightened ACL injury risk versus those that are valuable for higher levels of sidestepping performance? If so, how would your team overcome this? Yeah, that's a, a great question. The million dollar question really, I guess, is we want to be able to increase the performance of an athlete while they they sidestep, but we want to make sure they don't get hurt in doing that. And there's been some great uh, papers uh, out recently comparing that those metrics as well. Uh, a nice uh, review by Aaron Fox, I think, compares compares the two, the sort of uh, two sides of the, the coin. But um, in terms of the coaching stuff that we worked in, yeah, I guess they... As a whole, they were concerned about in an elite setting as well, and in any sporting setting, you have uh, you're really time poor. So we want to make sure that we dedicate time towards something that's going to be effective. And and normally the last thing on the list is injury prevention training. In terms of the like take, you know, if if we're improving an athlete's uh, <clears throat> uh, strength and technique, then then that will translate into majoritively uh, will sort of lead to increases in performance as well. So as a whole, they weren't concerned because at the time they were concerned about the injury prevention metric. But yeah, definitely a huge space that I think we're, we're all working towards understanding um, how we can sort of improve both. Okay. And I have one more question. And uh, the question is a very interesting one. We have a lot of student researchers who are members of ISBS. Aside from them coming to ISBS conferences, as you just mentioned, what would your top bit of advice be for them as they embark on their careers in uh, biomechanics, biomechanics in sport? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think I've, I've been really lucky. I think ISBS does an incredible job of engaging uh, our student members. And I think uh, in get, going to a conference and engaging with, with other students, and I think so honestly, some of my best friends, I think, uh, I, I've met through ISBS and we, we speak very regularly and, and whether they be from the UK or, or Europe, I think engaging with them and, and especially in the current uh, times, it's very easy to engage with these, these people over Twitter and Zoom and, and organising catch-ups that way. I also find, I think, Twitter came around after I finished my PhD and I found that's a great way to sort of, you know, when you go to a conference and you meet your... Um, you're like you become a bit of a fan of, of one of your favorite researchers and you meet them at a conference and now you can actually engage with them over Twitter. So I think everyone, we all love talking about our research and we all love talking about science. So I think it's really easy to engage with your peers uh, over, over social media as well. Um, just one more um, that came in from uh, a very good friend of ours, uh, Ross Miller. How accurate do infield estimates of knee moment needs to be to be useful for predicting, explaining, preventing injury? Are there uh, are we there already, or we still need to improve more? Oh, always a great question from Ross Miller. Um, yeah, well, I think the the work that mm-hmm. uh, Professor Alderson and the team, uh, as part of the digital athlete concept, they are able to really well match the. Um, the knee joint moments just from the marker trajectories. And there was a recent paper that that uh, Bill Johnson just published um, that actually used IMUs to predict the, the knee joint moments from these, these neural networks. So I think we're almost there. And, and there are a lot of markerless motion capture technology. And I, I know particularly in baseball at the moment, all of the baseball teams are using markerless motion capture technology, which capture um, capture the, the um, the dynamics really well it's it's amazing to see that it's it's not just a, a gimmick it's actually they can you're able to do that really well currently so i feel like 
within the next Honestly, five years, I think we're going to see a huge shift in the way that we can uh, perform our research in these sort of really ecologically valid settings. And by using, you know, we're going back to 2D video, we spent all this time establishing 3D motion capture, which I think is is still going to um, be around and still incredibly useful. But now we can utilise the match footage that is always being collected for us. And from that, we can generate huge amounts of, of data that we can investigate together as a, as a group. Um, this is a really interesting question, and this was on my list of questions for you too. Are your ecological measures accurate enough to trust them? Ecological measures in what yeah. in what sense? Well, uh, the measures that you make uh, uh, during game performance. Uh, so, in terms of uh, like match perform or the the measures during the game. Yeah. Yeah, I think. Can I would you trust them? Yeah, I feel like. Uh, as if I can mirror what I what I just mentioned with with Ross's question, if I'm understanding correctly, I think based on the initial results of of these studies that are coming out of of, uh, of other universities, you know that the R square value, the R values that we compare the waveforms of the knee moments predicted from the 3D motion capture versus the the um, the trained neural networks, the the R values were over sort of 0.95. So I think uh, yes. Okay. Well. We're out of time now, and so I would like to end this session. Thank you, Jill, uh, for an absolutely wonderful talk. Thank you.